All right, so welcome back, everybody. This is Boris Aratia uh, with GSA. I'm the designated federal officer for the GSA Acquisition Policy Federal Advisory Committee. So it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, we are, I would say it's like meeting number 14 for this subcommittee. So they are definitely adding up. Um, had a great discussion yesterday with our acquisition worker subcommittee, and then we have one tomorrow with our policy and practice. But today it's all about industry partnerships. And um, also with me is my, my deputy, uh, Stephanie Hardison, there she is. And then we also have uh, Dave Kochenik uh, on my team as supporting as well. And then we also have Skylar Holloway also supporting us. Um, we have a lot going on today. Before we get too far, I wanted to do a brief roll call and see who we have here from the subcommittee. So I'm going to start with, um, and Dave, you can help me take that then. We have uh, Farad. I see Denise. Yep. Uh, Gail. Present. Great. Uh, we also have, uh, let's see, I'm going to see Susan. I uh, don't see Susan. Mamie, has Mamie joined? Uh, no. Daryl? Uh, I know she won't be here. And Kristen, we have you. Yes. Uh, Stacy. See Stacy. Nigel. See Nigel. Uh, then we have Keith. Aquí. Aquí. <laughs> Muy bien, aquí. Uh, That's what I remember now. All right. So oh, good. Good. Uh, <laughs> David and Kimberly. All right. Very well. So uh, we have a lot to discuss today. I'm really looking forward to the conversations. And uh, we also have a couple members of the public here. And as we go through our conversations and discussions with the subcommittee team members, um, if you have any comments after those conversations, we're going to allow normally about five minutes or so after those. And you're welcome to chime in if you have any comments or anything you want to add. Uh, but uh, this is, a, again, a great work that's been going through and uh, now since September of 2022, which was our inaugural meeting. And um, really looking forward to the conversation today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen Siever, our chair of the Industry Partnership Subcommittee for the GAP Act. Kristen, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, Boris and Stephanie. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for getting on uh, and committing your time, given everyone's busy schedules. We're super excited about our session today. Um, and just to kind of level set for everyone, uh, we are fine tuning a couple of recommendations from this subcommittee for the full committee around how, um, how we can help uh, GSA be more inclusive and search for a more broader and diverse uh, supplier base, how we can bring in new innovative entrants particularly to help tackle climate and sustainability issues and concerns. Um, and we're also working on a recommendation that we call the Lighthouse, which is about how can we connect groups, networks of networks to ensure that we're creating, for lack of a better uh, word, like an exchange or a mesh so that GSA has the opportunity to reach broader markets, sub-markets, mini-markets, and those folks have better avenues and pathways to reach the government uh, and engage in the federal supplier base and thrive in the federal supplier base. So if you're coming in as a small company, that you're able to thrive and grow. And so with that, we have what we're calling a focus group. So we'll probably spend the majority of our meeting talking with these two um, awesome people that have agreed to join us. So I'm really excited about it. Just to tee up the format. We're going to have uh, Tia Perry speak to us first and then engage with some questions and for the first 40, 45 minutes. And then we'll switch over to John and I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on both of these um, amazing folks uh, as we get started. Um, so let me first introduce Tia Perry and she is an award-winning diversity, equity and inclusion leader. She is currently the executive director of AEC Unites. Um, which I just love this. And she is tasked with bringing the vision of the association to life, which means, right, uh, that means action to me, Tia. That means action and results. Absolutely. Uh, you know, to drive equity and inclusion for black talent and black owned businesses in the architecture, engineering and construction community. So uh, really looking forward to hearing from you today. 
And then John Bray's is uh, a contact of mine from my former life in um, federal government. Uh, but John joins us from uh, Mirror Ventures, and he has a history of uh, working with startups, venture capital, started his own venture capital investment firm, really uh, dives into emerging tech and how to get them as well to engage with the government. And he has some experiences in that area to, to uh, talk to us about. The one thing I love about John that he brings to the table is he's a lifelong learner and he's really been embracing like what we're doing here at Gap Back and really trying to understand it so that he can bring his best talent to that. Um, so with that, I think we'll jump in and get started. And so Tia, uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and talk to the subcommittee a little bit about uh, who you are and what you bring to the table. And then we can um, either you through comments can address some of the questions we sent or we can go right into Q&A, but we'll follow your lead on that. Before we do that though, anything else we need to talk about before we get started from the subcommittee? Everybody good and ready to go? Yeah, I'm really excited. So Tia, uh, go ahead. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you. Thank you. So to start, thank you to Boris and Stephanie and you, Kristen, as well. Um, I actually put a few slides together. I, I won't bore you all with um, a ton of content, but I, I think it's a great reference to um, some of my talking points. Just give me one second. Um, all right, can you all see? Can you all see my slides? Awesome. Okay. So AEC Unites is a newly formed 501c6 um, trade association advocating for Black talent and Black-owned businesses in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. Um, AEC Unites is special because it was actually founded by one of your subcommittee members, Daryl McKissick, who I'm sure you all know has a rich history in the architecture and design space um, several generations ago um, from her great-grandfather who started um, as a slave. And so Daryl and several of her colleagues have been having conversations um, over the last several years about the need to advance equity and really diversify the talent pipeline. Um, the work of AEC Unites will focus on two main pillars. Uh, I think there's a lot of alignment with our business pillar which will focus on advocating for black owned businesses, um, helping to provide equitable resources and ultimately to help them win work, which I think aligns perfectly with what you all are doing here. Um, and then our model is very similar in the sense that um, we're a newly formed association. We actually officially launched October 3rd. We have around 50 members um, and collectively these logos and this representation here on this slide, um, these are some of the top architects, engineers, and contractors in the nation. Um, they've committed to equity of Black talent and Black-owned businesses. And these are our board of directors and the leaders of AEC Unites. Um, I mentioned earlier, earlier a little bit, our vision is to really elevate the AEC industry by driving equity and inclusion for Black talent. Um, and we want to do this by really facilitating intentional opportunities and be really intentional with the communities that we serve and our outreach. Um, as a, a parent of a, a Black teenager, I'm very, very intentional with just exposing my children to the careers in construction, architecture, and engineering, because prior to my role in my space um, or my work in construction, I had an innocent ignorance about the opportunities. Um, and so there's so many amazing career opportunities. Um, the pledge at the bottom of the slide is all of our members really commit to this pledge. Um, we recognize that we're better together and they all commit to really evaluating their processes and their procedures to really ensure that it is um, fair and inclusive. Um, it's not discriminatory in any nature. Um, they all commit to um, hiring black firms as tier one suppliers whenever possible and really enforcing strict goals to use minority suppliers on all projects. Um, I talked earlier about two pillars. This is the talent pillar. Um, really, it's about diversifying the talent pipeline. There's a huge labor shortage. Uh, the last number I saw from the Associated Builders and Contractors is we need to hire over half a million workers to continue the demands of labor for 2023. And so um, as an organization, we're very intentional about developing partnerships with um, K through 12 programs and different um, industry folks that are supporting the talent pipeline 
and then making it crystal clear for parents and aunties and uncles and guidance counselors and grandparents who are interested in their child or grandchild or, or niece or nephew um, who are interested in the construction trades or being an engineer or an architect. And so AEC Unites, our goal is to make it really, really easy for them and to develop a pipeline and a pathway of resources, internships, mentorship opportunities. Um, and so we're really building out our website now. Um, so it's really a, a resource for Black talent. Ultimately, the, the board of directors wants to develop an app um, where, for example, I can go into the app, plug in my zip code, and any resources related to engineering for Fredericksburg, Virginia would populate. And so that's something that we're working on as well. Um, for the work with the GSA um, alignment, I think there are a ton of synergies around our business pillar, and that's really creating sustainable opportunities and supporting Black-owned businesses to advance their growth and business capacity in the AEC space. Um, we have close to 50 member companies, a very, very diverse group of majority and minority firms um, representing several different verticals in the industry. And um, ultimately, our, our mission is clear. We know we want to provide equitable resources, identify what challenges our contractors and engineers and architects are facing, and then really unifying the AEC industry and collectively providing resources. Um, we recognize there are a ton of business programs out there. Um, there are a ton of STEM and ACE programs out there. And I think it's a bit fragmented in the sense that you gotta do a lot of time um, online on the website, trying to identify what resources are out there. And so our group, um, we really wanna streamline that and really advocate for black owned businesses to help them when work in the marketplace. And so um, the teal blue bullets are our year one goals, uh, really advocate for changing policies to increase equitable opportunities to support black owned businesses, uh, support our clients commitment with some logo and branding, um, and then also produce a playbook for our members on how do they procure sustainable opportunities for black owned businesses and then support their commitments with a logo um, or a pledge, our pledge logo. Um, prepare black owned businesses for scalable growth. Uh, we talked about really identifying the black owned AEC firms in the nation and how do we highlight their successes? You know, we would develop some sort of criteria to highlight top achievers of the best of the best and really prepare um, these companies for growth and highlight them and market them. Um, and there would be an industry-wide robust effort to really highlight our top performers that are members of our organization. And then lastly, create a database of Black-owned firms. Um, I believe the Black Chamber has one that's specific to several industries. Um, we want to develop a black owned business database for architects, engineering, engineering and construction. Um, and our member companies can, um, would pay to access the site, but black firms could create a profile for free. We think it's important that um, we identify these companies and um, really help to highlight the successes and their capabilities and um, things of that nature. Um, so that's it for the PowerPoint slide. Um, but I just want to give you guys a high level overview of AEC Unites. Um, we are a 501c6. We started with 12 members who really had a passion for advancing equity after the murder of George Floyd. Floyd. And um, collectively, these leaders have been meeting for the last two years or so. Um, very, very strategic. We had our um, strategic plan with a professional facilitator come in and help us map out our vision and our mission and kind of put some action behind it. Um, and then we broke into smaller subgroups. We have a talent subgroup and a business subgroup who are focused on the talent and business pillars. Um, and so we have some action plans that are very strategic in the sense of this is um, their strategies and you know how we're going to accomplish these goals. Um, so I know I've covered a lot, but in a nutshell, that's AEC Unites. And I do think 
um, the lighthouse model, there's a lot of alignment as far as partnering. You know, we don't want to reinvent the wheel as an association. We recognize there are a lot of great resources out there. Um, collectively, we want to partner with other organizations um, to really make it crystal clear for minority businesses and also folks that are interested in a career in AEC um, to identify opportunities in the marketplace. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, really, really powerful stuff. So we've got a, um, and I see Daryl was able to join us, which I'm super happy about. Thank you, Daryl, uh, for introducing us to Tia. So we've got a myriad of questions, which I sent you, Tia, but, um, and we can start with those and then please subcommittees, uh, you just, you can use the raise your hand or just come off. And if we have additional questions, that would be great. You know, one question I want to start with, which was down towards the bottom of the list, because it tied more to the lighthouse, was um, I love what you said about not wanting to reinvent the wheel. Um, and so you you, you and your uh, organization have a very targeted market, and, and that's great. But can you talk to us from your experience? Because um, sometimes we take this for granted, uh, is the importance of building strategic, I think you used the word intentional, like strategic and intentional relationships. Um, and so I thought maybe we could start with that from your experience and what you guys hope to do at AEC Unites. Um, and the reason I'm asking this question is when we think to build out the lighthouse, I, I wanna make sure we don't forget the important part about building relationships um, as we go forward versus just kind of putting a recommendation in place. So we'll start yeah. with that and then we'll see where we go. Okay, sure, great question. So. Um, <laughs> As I mentioned, AEC Unites officially launched on October 3rd. And since our launch, we have been inundated with partnership requests. Um, it's a great, uh, a great problem and a great challenge, uh, but we're getting tons of requests. I think I've gotten three or four today alone from folks who wanna partner with our association. Um, and so my recommendation to the board is that we develop some sort of criteria of who, what you know, interest groups we're interested in partnering with. Um, of course, there has to be alignment with our strategic plan and our mission, but develop criteria um, and also firms that have a global footprint. What I mean by that is we're a national organization, we have members throughout the US. And so we wanna partner with organizations that can service our members and have resources and programs that can service the membership. Um, but very, very strategic in the sense that we brought in um, a couple of facilitators to really help us map this out, to really um, leverage the resources of our member companies. And um, there's, ton there's tons of passion, but we have to be realistic with expectations and bandwidth and resources. And so we invested in a couple of facilitators to really help us bring our vision to life. Does that answer your question, Kristen? Certainly gets it started. I, I And I think, again, I heard the word being purposeful. And I think, you know, as we try to build out this lighthouse recommendation, um, it can get pretty overwhelming fast when you're saying you're trying to reach everybody. So understanding some of these different and newer groups that are coming to bear and then how, where can we find, I think Nigel likes to use that point, those intersecting points um, to start to create this mesh. Um, so I think I think that's good. I'll ask one other question and then we'll see. I know the others might have some other questions. Um, fr from your perspective, is is it in the wheelhouse for your organization of, um, to help these companies do work with the government? And if so, do you have any experiences or perspectives that you would like to talk to us about about some of the challenges for um, some of the uh, companies you're hoping to represent in, in dealing with the government and, and thriving in that federal supplier base? Absolutely. So prior to this call, I had a call, um, a couple of calls with a few of our members that do a lot of work with GSA just to learn more about some of their struggles and some of their challenges. Um, and I'm more than happy to connect you all if you want to follow up after this call and speak directly to them. Um, if, if that's appropriate, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, and, and what I'm hearing from a lot of our members um, is the administrative requirements on government projects are a huge demand, especially for small businesses with typically very limited staff. I mean, some of our member companies, I think about some of the smallest, I mean, they're probably less than 10 employees. And so in order to really navigate the rules and the regulations, it can be really overwhelming um, 
and difficult to follow unless they have a contract officer. And so I didn't know if there were any opportunities to provide a cheat sheet um, or um, almost like a playbook. You know, there are a ton of resources online with SBA and then there's SAM.gov. But as a small business, I'm not sure I would know where to start. And so um, I think any opportunities to really streamline um, the administrative burden and that challenge, that's what I'm hearing from our member companies. And then also the reporting side of some of the reporting requirements um, are cumbersome. And a lot of contractors may avoid government work because of the heavy lift of the reporting. Um, so that's some of the conversations I've had over the last couple of weeks. Great, that's helpful. Uh, I appreciate you reaching out to um, some of your members and then uh, offering to connect. Any, um, I would assume in, in the sectors that you, you all are working on, uh, the challenges with climate and sustainability requirements um, any any insights there as far as how how these companies are looking at that? Are some trying to actually get ahead of that and be kind of a leader in climate and sustainability? From I think we all recognize the importance. Um, you know, we have a very diverse group of primes, and we have some smaller subcontractors. It's it's not something that we've talked to them exact. You know, like specifically about. Um, I do know they're very, very intentional um, with their efforts, but it's not something I've asked um, or surveyed our members to get their, their thoughts on. So I don't know if I'd be the best person to ask that question, um, but I'm more than happy to follow up if you have some questions that we can survey the members maybe to kind of gauge some of their interests. Um, we can do that as well. So one of the things I heard though is um, the requirements for proposals could be overwhelming for smaller companies. Um, and so, you know, you sort of have to, to, to lessen those a little bit. What I mean by that, if, if you want to have, say, five identical projects of the same size in the last five years, a larger company might well, very well have that. Doesn't make that mean that they're the best, not necessarily because those people may be tied up on other projects where a smaller company may have the people available that could do the work, but they don't have five projects just like that one in the last five years. It takes sometimes three to five years to build something. Mm -hmm. So um, that's past performance requirements. Yeah, the requirements are yeah. too stringent and they need to be a little relaxed. Um, and sometimes I think, I don't know if it's that boilerplate stuff gets into the proposals. I mean, the, the RFPs or not, but um, even the certification requirements or the licensing requirements may not apply to the type of project that you know, you're proposing on, um, but that precludes you from being able to go after it because of the licenses that they're asking for. Okay, yep. Good feedback, for sure. Antonio, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great presentation, a lot of good information. Thank you for sharing. And congratulations for getting this up and up and running. Uh, it sounds really, really exciting. And um, so, Tia, I'm with the Small Business Administration, and I welcome you know, one what you guys have been able to put together already. But I think there's probably some a, a good opportunity for uh, for us at the U.S. Small Business Administration, where we have an intentional focus on equity, uh, it's part of the, the fact that you know the entire administration is very focused on equity. There's some inherent challenges that exist with smaller companies trying to get into the federal contracting space beyond just competition. And Daryl just laid out several of them uh, very nicely. Uh, I, I'd also like to consider whether there are some ways we could look to help people in that education process around this so that at least as they go through this process, they're as, as informed as possible about what to expect, which may help them make decisions on what things they go for with a lot of gusto and what things maybe they don't go for as much because it may be beyond the, the scope or the, the capabilities of the firm at that particular moment in that particular time, but they may be still building to it. 
And so if there's a, a, a space where we could um, connect on this to just uh, understand a little bit more about uh, the members and uh, what kind of things they're they're looking at, and uh, perhaps there's some things that we could conceive within the SBA. Some things we probably already have that we could offer, but there may be some other things that would be really specific to this group. So uh, I put that out that there as a, a a welcome mat over Zoom to say, you know, we'd be happy to talk about it. Yeah, let's let's continue the conversation. I'm sure there are workshops and training sessions um, that would really help our, our members understand the process and requirements. And um, so let's connect and just just make sure that we can, you know, just continue the conversation about what resources are available. Definitely. And 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 I would suggest not even just limiting to the specifics of government contracting, but if if there's not already um, a robust component that's being developed or being implemented some kind of way around just sort of the business ownership uh growth you know ceo leadership training kind of things uh i think that's always something that's really really important that would be so fantastic antonio okay because, um sba just has a wealth of information i think that our um membership could usually really work with Definitely. And even for our, uh, the majority firms that are part of AEC Unites, they complain sometimes about their clients not really providing requirements in an RFP that makes it easy for mm -hmm. them to joint venture with right, minority right. or smaller companies. And they would like to see that change. Um, and that's another playbook that AEC Unites would be working on. Fantastic. But SBA can help tremendously. As my, and um, I know Kristen asked about the government, um, if the government was involved. Mitch Landrew has been with mm -hmm. us through this whole process. Oh, he was excellent. at the launch. He spoke at, at the launch um, a month ago, but has been working behind scenes with us on this for at least a year and a half. Excellent. Very good. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just seeing if any of the other subcommittees. Um, you talked about um, you uh, you have kind of like larger prime uh, companies uh, and then smaller companies. So are are you looking within your own organization to do any type of mentor protege uh, partnering? Um, because that's something we've talked about a lot. Also, um, how to make that work better could be helpful, but I'd, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on where you think you're going with that. Yes. Yeah, so we want to provide um, resources to our member companies about joint ventures um, and Dale chime in if I, if I happen to miss anything, but um, JVs and joint ventures and teaming opportunities and absolutely, maybe there's a playbook of best practices, um, and maybe GSA can help us with that as well, but definitely something that we um, want to provide our membership. Well, on the business side, we want to be a clearinghouse, and, um, and that clearinghouse could be anything that's having to do with the AEC industry, but one could be, I'm a big company, and I'm looking for a mentor, in a, a mentee in a certain city or in a certain business tight, I mean, or building tight. Um, it could be, I have a huge job I'm going after and I need to find, you know, so many firms in this area that I can work with and team with on this job. We want them to be able to say, I'm coming to AEC Unites to help me find these people or to find these companies and who are the top rated firms that we can work with on this and who are the firms that need to be mentored and are smaller that need to grow. Um, we want to be that clearinghouse. What I love, if, if I can chime in, but what I actually Please. love um, about this, one of my sticking points has always been, I've been in the federal space, you know, forever. And, and you find, um, you know, people just kind of show up and say, Hey, I've got a partner to kind of check a box. I love the fact that you guys are, um, are uh, valuing and validating the people that are in your program. So when you provide these people to partner, it's a legitimate partnership. And I'm pretty sure you guys will ensure uh, the way the joint venture is set up, the way the mentor uh, protege deal is set up, that these guys will actually grow and hopefully one day 
kind of be able to stand on their own. That should be the end game. I'm assuming that's correct, right? That that is we're developing the criteria for that, um, but absolutely. Um, yeah. And so, and I'm crystal clear in our marketing that you know AEC Unites is really about providing equitable opportunities. Um, it's not a set asides program. I think when some people see that our language around um, intentional opportunities for Black talent, um, you know, there's a misconception that it, it's about set asides, and it's it's really about providing equitable resources to help our members to rise on their own merit. Um, and to compete in the marketplace. Good and to identify opportunities for them. But I wanted to go back to another question, Kristen, you had about how, you said, how do we narrow this down? Because there's so many ways that you could go into this, right? Yeah. There's so many ways to lean into DEI these days, right? And then there's so many types of people that need this type of assistance. Um, but we truly had to narrow it down. Um, and that's why it is around just Black. Um, we felt like no matter how you slice it, Black people always fall down to the bottom. And if we could fix the bottom, then all boats would rise. Um, and it's something that could be replicated, you know, for, for Latinos and for women and Asians and the list can go on and on. But at the end of the day, Black people are always at the bottom. We had the lowest, it's, and this is data, it's not Daryl McKissick making this up. I mean, we had the lowest percentage in the AEC industry, okay? We're 17% of the population, and we're 6% of the industry. So, you know, we decided, okay, and, and these are my, also my co-chairs who are um, majority CEOs, so Turner Construction and Jacobs, you know, billion dollar companies who are saying, no, we want to do it just black. So um, the other thing is then you said, you say to yourselves, well, there's so many things that we can do. But my point to the whole industry is, okay, how can we just pick two or three things and do that? Do that really well. <laughs> okay. So we had the facilitator come in and you know, we were all across the board on what we could do. Like Tia said, it's taken a year and a half for us to get down to just two pillars. And within those two pillars, get down to about five things that we said we could do. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of really, you know, pulling, distilling it down to the things that we really can do. And so whenever I deal with something with the federal government, I feel like it's huge. I feel like it takes forever for policy to get through. Um, if this group can really come up with something that is obtainable, okay, number one, but that's distilled down to something that we can really make a difference on. Wow. Sorry, I was taking so many notes, Daryl. Um, and if we think, if we kind of back up from the lighthouse, um, what we would hope to do, I think in our recommendation is to um, send a message in our recommendation that even though the government is big, it's these small entities like an AEC Unites, and we hope to have some other examples that we need to know exist and that we need to connect. And we've got to have these connections. So, um, and so I think that's where, that's kind of where we want to go with the vision. The second thing you said that I think is so powerful is if you are creating something that is replicable across all, uh, some other small, you know, segment, it's in, you just you just use the stats. This is important, and but it's it's still very uh, focused and small, and sometimes that gets ignored by the big. And so, if you create something that's replicable, to, to you said to other markets, that's extremely powerful, and that is something that then the power of government could help with. Uh, you know, sure. getting that out. That's where you know that coming back into SBA or GSA, and then going back out. To the to the universe as a playbook to follow is extremely powerful. So I picked up a ton of stuff there. Um, I'm I just want to be mindful. Does anyone else on the subcommittee have some other questions? Or I got a few more, but I don't want to dominate the airwaves here. Can I ask one question? I I just want to 
thank Tia uh, for her time. I, I really appreciate it. But I would really love to know a little bit about your um, your members, your board members, and your recruitment strategy a little bit more. If you could expand on that a bit, it'd be great, sure. helpful finding the right people. Sure. So um, I started in March um, as the executive director, and prior to my start, and I'll let Daryl um, speak about how she hand selected her um, her founders, but. Um, what I know is that Daryl was very strategic in the sense that um, she picked leaders that were passionate um, about advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the AEC space. Um, I'll let her chime in on that. As far as the membership recruitment, um, we are aggressively recruiting members. Um, as you all know, um, organizations um, like AEC Unites, it's, it, takes, it takes money, right? It takes money and it takes resources. And so we're trying to leverage the resources of our member companies, but we're also um, recruiting members to really help us move the needle forward. And so our ask is that um, a company in the AEC space, um, we even have some interest from some corporate clients as well, um, but a company comes in and we don't want them to just write a check. We want them to really get involved and to either join our talent pillar and help us specifically focus on diversifying the talent pipeline or help us with the businesses and some of the challenges that our minority businesses are facing. Um, Daryl, did you wanna add anything about, you know, you selecting your, uh, your founders? Yeah, well, you know, the whole concept of AEC Unites is that especially when it comes to um, identifying minority firms or working with minority firms, it seems like we're the certification process is with people who don't even know our business, right? One day you're certified by somebody who's looking at you as an architectural engineer, engineering firm. The next day you're certified by someone. I mean, they, they were looking at a company that makes widgets, which is completely different than what we do. So they don't understand what we do. So the whole concept of AEC Unites was that people that are our members truly understand what we do so that we can really know, we know how to really change the situation. So I wanted a cross section of architectural engineering and construction and some firms who do all three um, as founders. Also, I wanted some national minority firms to also black owned firms to be founders. And so that's how I found my founders, but the founders that I, you know, these are people that I've known through the industry for a long time. I knew that they were already doing stuff in their company. For example, Jacobs has the Harambe um, group, which is something for their 5,000 black employees. Turner has something similar, the black something group. Um, they were already pushing DEI. And, and some of them said to me, Dora, why do we need to do this? I'm already doing it in my company. But my point was, yes, you're doing it in your, point, your company. And that's why I'm asking you, because what we need is best practices from all companies to make sure we're doing it the best in every company. And so if we could get alignment on what we, what we how we want to push this needle forward, we can do a better job. And they believed it. So... <laughs> so they're on board. And of course, the Black companies are, you know, we have Moody Nolan, um, Russell, uh, and Powers. So, you know, we started with, if we have 12 and, you know, more than 12, it gets hard to work with them and figure out what to do next. And, you know, ideas get lost. But um, so that's how we started. But then the next thing was that founding group paid money, right? But then it's bringing in our memberships. And we've been bringing in members, which is great. But now we're starting a director's um, circle because they're big companies who are saying, hey, I want to be a big founder. I mean, I want to be a founder where you can't be a founder because that train left two years ago. But you can be in the director's circle. Part of the business side came about because I have big clients that are asking all the time, Daryl, how can we have sustainable work for Black businesses? So the next group of people is our corporate council. And we have major corporations who are giving us good money um, because they're already, they already have, are doing programs to have sustainable work for black businesses. Um, but they wanna work with other companies. It's kind of like the billion dollar round table. 
Um, and now they're all coming on board. Now that they're hearing about it, they want to be able to say, yes, well, we have AEC Unites on our website. We're members, we're corporate council because we're intentionally making sure that we have sustainable work for Black business. And when Tia was saying it's not a set aside, you know, to take it just a little bit further, it's more of a client saying, I have for the next 10 years, I'm spending $100 billion. How can I set not have projects where with, with a Black company, if they're doing one, because this is what happens, you do one, and you do a great job and then they say thank you and they've checked it off and they've worked with a black company and then you don't have any more work you lose all your talent and all of that so how do you take that that talent and put it on your next job and your next job because essentially that's what happens with big firms they get checks from these big companies every single month and they grow and they go from one job to the next job to the next job um, we're just asking that the same thing happens to black companies. And that's the only way we're gonna do something about this, the wealth gap, which is so huge when you look at the numbers for blacks versus whites in the country. Oh, awesome. And you know what? I'm like sitting here thinking that, you know, AEC Unites is a lighthouse, uh, you know, and it's just, it's, it's on a very clearly thought out uh, segment of the population that you want to attract and create a beacon for. So if we can identify all those mini lighthouses out there and help the government create a big lighthouse, um, I just want to be my, I think, Gail, did you want to get in here? I just want to make sure. Yeah, real quickly, um, I love this AEC Unite because I can put HBCU Unite as another lighthouse on this because the same challenges. And as we develop our students and through the path, pathways, through their career pathways, you know, I could change some of those names and have HBCU on there because the same challenges exist even more for us as HBCUs. And I'm glad that you, um, Daryl um, and um, Tia, have put in 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 your um, program a HBCU focused. So I would like to talk to you more because as more HBCUs are applying for and being awarded the GSA contract, we have even more challenges because the government does not understand some of the uh, capacities and, and capabilities of HBCUs. And as they um, uh, their, their strategic plans are to do more work with HBCUs, my conversations with the federal government is they really don't know how. And the only way they know how is through internships. And there's so much more in HBCUs to do than you know, hire our interns. I mean, hire our students for interns. But so I think that that is another track for this committee to consider and using almost the same um, purpose, goals and objectives as the AEC Unite because the same challenges exist or quite frankly, even more with the HBCUs. And every government has a, um, has a uh, commitment to do more work with HBCUs. And we need to bridge that gap and understand and figure out how to do that better. Thank so you. thank you, Daryl, Daryl, for you. I'm excited about the HBCUs because um, I missed the early part of Tia's presentation, but I'm sure she talked to you about the career paths and getting um, kids through the career paths. Right now in my industry, if HBCU is graduating an architect or engineer, we will find them a job. Well, no we, ifs, ands, or buts. We've got to, we've got to hire 600,000 people in the next 10 years. We're, we're right now, the BLS is saying that we're hiring 25,000 new people a month. So they need, at this point, and this is why our industry is so excited about AEC Unites, they have run out of white people. <laughs> They've got to start using under underutilized people. Mm -hmm. And it's solving a, a crime problem. It's solving a whole humanitarian problem. I mean, the list goes on and on on the good. And it's bringing new and innovative ideas into our industry. 
So you're talking about a major infrastructure job. This is what I talked to Rich about. Okay, and I've seen those come and go in the last 30 years. Most of those times, black people, brown people are completely left out of those bills. So all that money flies down, but we don't get any of it. Um, but they're in our neighborhoods. Okay, and now we're talking about infrastructure in the neighborhoods that mm -hmm. stuff that we build today is gonna, we have to live with it for the next 20 to 30 years. We need the insight and the perspective of the people that are living there. And they need to be working on them as engineers and architects. Other thing I always tell them too at the White House is look, we need a campaign because we lose people in STEM to IT and all these other things. AEC Unites wants to bring them into our industry and they have to feel comfortable when they get here. They can't feel like I felt 40 years ago working for corporate America in AEC industry, okay? With no, and we, there are so many organizations out there that are doing this. And I don't know if Tia talked to you about leader flow, but leader flow. Okay, so we want to connect all of these great organizations that are one, bringing kids into STEM at a young age at six. I sit on a board called Living Classroom. We bring in about, I don't know, 100, 200 kids in DC into STEM. Then I sit on another executive board called ACE, where we mentor high school kids in STEM. We're giving them internships in our companies in the summer. We're helping them now through college and giving them internships and promising them a job when they graduate. You can't beat that. Exactly. I'm, I'm also working with College Success Fund where um, Robert Craves, Ron Craves, who was the founder of Costco with Bill and Melinda Gates has raised over a billion dollars to send um, under historically uh, underprivileged kids to college for free. But these kids don't know this. I mean, my dream is that there we have an app where if you have a child in LA and they wanna be, they don't know what they wanna be, but they wanna do something in AEC, they can go on that app and say, okay, here's where you can get them interested in STEM. Here's where they can get money, grants, college education, and here's where they can get a job. We are desperate in our industry. We are just desperate. And so it's a time now to, you know, feed people through and get them jobs. Gail, I sent you a message in the chat. Let's, let's touch base um, after this call about synergies. Right, I just sent you my email. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Right, thank you so much. I want to be mindful of time. I, I have a selfish question for our subcommittee that I'd ask you to think about for us. So as we're prepping this lighthouse recommendation, we would like to pepper it with some examples. So for example, connecting, connecting organizations like AEC with XYZ. So from your perspective and experience, if you can think about um, any other organizations that we might not be seeing or thinking about that should be included in or could help exemplify our recommendation, that would be super helpful. Um, so for example, like John is coming on later and he's gonna be talking about emerging tech and venture capital. And so there's probably groups that he deals with that we're not even looking at. Um, Gail's brought up the issues, great advocate for the HCBUs. You know, we've got to, we've got to have people help us say, you're missing a whole segment over here. Here's a couple groups to contact. So if you have any of that, that would be super helpful to us and um, we can reconnect or do it via email. Well, before we let you, do you have any questions for us as a subcommittee uh, about our direction? We shared with you a little bit about our recommendations. Um, so Tia, just from your perspective, uh, any- I do not. Stephanie and Boris um, kind of brought me up to speed. And so I'm familiar with, with the model and, and what you guys are looking to do. So if I can be of assistance or um, moving forward or you know, however I can help, just let me know. Okay, awesome. All right, anybody else for Tia? And Tia, you're more than welcome to stay and listen to our second half here but we also want to be mindful of your time. And thank you so much uh, for uh, participating with us. It's super helpful. 
Hey, hey Kristen, I just wanted to, something you just said, I, and I really love hearing the story at here because that's really what we're trying to do at GSA. You know, just, you, you're modeling what we're trying to think of from the bigger picture where we're, we're really helping connect. Like Kristen said, we didn't know you existed here. We didn't know you were here. Even though we're pretty large, there's gonna be a lot of places we're gonna miss. And that's, this exemplifies what we're really trying to do at the uh, GSA. And then this is focused on GSA, knowing that GSA influences a lot of the rest of the federal government. Uh, and if we implement a GSA, then it has a good potential of catching beyond just GSA. So, but yeah, I really appreciate the story. Very, very uh, well done, indeed. Thank you. Thanks, Tia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Tia, so much. Um, okay, so switching gears a little bit, we have John Braze with us, and I think I gave you a little bit of his history, and I'll let John um, talk to you uh, a little bit about that as we open up. But uh, a couple of key points from his bio that really uh, stuck with me. One is um, was a U.S. Navy nuclear submariner, so has uh, that that government's uh, perspective and mission perspective. Uh, and I love this, that he's, uh, he believes in humble learning and continuous growth and the power of collaboration. So really happy John is here. To set up his remarks a little bit, he's really, we kind of identified John relative to our recommendation around how can GSA attract uh, innovative new entrants uh, into the federal supplier space, whether in general or in particular to help us with our climate risk mitigation and sustainability goals. So he's coming at this from a little bit different perspective and we've got a bunch of questions teed up for him relative to that. So with John, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank, thank you, Kristen. And I, I don't have any presentation per se other than maybe a few uh, opening talking points, <laughs> excuse me. And uh, actually, I, I was uh, very interested in the previous conversation because there's a lot of overlaps uh, that, that we see, and I think uh, a lot of tie-ins to the, that topic uh, with the technology space, I think, is, especially as we know that um, you know that topic is especially acute in the technology um, industry and, and early stage technology industry. But so I, as Kristen said, uh, my name is John Brazy. Uh, I'd actually like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, to the subcommittee, um, and also thanks to Kristen for introducing me here and for letting me bend her ear with uh, various topics and ideas that I've had on the, the, the space um, from time to time. And uh, as, as Kristen mentioned, uh, she introduced me to the committee through my work with MER, which is a, a firm my partners and I run, and we have two uh, principal areas of business that we uh, are relevant to technology companies. Uh, one is Mer Ventures, through which any investment comes, and then uh, another a part of the business called Mer Meridian, with which we provide hands-on support for tech companies uh, in the specific area of operationalizing their go-to-market strategy, um, which we define as the holistic optimization of all aspects of revenue generation, and then the continual readiness to scale the business. And uh, I was also the founder of a uh, global angel network, which now has uh, 500 members. Uh, they actively invest and in, uh, through that network, we're looking at several thousand uh, technology companies a year um, with which to uh, evaluate potentially support and or invest in. So in that respect, our, our customers are early stage technology companies, usually they're between 500,000 to $3 million in revenue. Uh, uh, when investing, our customers would also be uh, our limited partners who provide capital uh, on a deal-by-deal -deal basis. And at our firm, we have a pretty eclectic focus in terms of industries, but we are generally preferring companies that are B2B, which B2G could fall into that, that category, um, that have recurring revenue models. Uh, we also look for companies that can go to market quickly with a, a minimum viable product, an MVP. Um, and then layer in more product sophistication over time as the, the company develops their technology and grows. Um, so in, in our business, maybe speaking to the Lighthouse topic, we collaborate with uh, startup accelerators, angel networks, uh, venture capital firms, uh, universities, and, and a variety of programs within the universities, uh, tech transfer offices for IP coming out of the uh, intellectual property coming out of the universities, the university accelerator programs, and uh, and a variety of other areas. Also with corporations and industry groups like the Angel Capital Association, for example. Um, 
Um, our company uh, doesn't presently participate in the government marketplace as a, as a, a vendor or, or a supplier, um, but we have worked with uh, tech companies to help them get onto the, the GSA uh, multiple award schedule uh, in the past um, for those that, that wanted to sell to the government. And uh, I think as, as regarding the two initiatives, the innovative entrance and then I, I think the lighthouse, um, when I think about those and the, the GSA, and I think that some people alluded to this also, it was like uh, they, they need to know that you exist. Um, so I, I was thinking about uh, that, you know, one approach might be to look at the GSA as by reframing it in that the it's not that the startups that are the supplier or the, the tech companies that are the supplier and the GSA is the customer, but in this case, you flip the tables and really the GSA is the uh, supplier and the tech companies are the, the customer in that sense. Um, and, and if you frame it that way, I think that one of the things, first things that probably would be realized is uh, brand awareness. I think a lot of tech companies don't even know the GSA exists. And if they do, they don't know what it does. And so that brand awareness is important in my mind uh, for the for this mission to just simply let them know, know that you exist and what you do and and finding them where they are. So you know whether that's via just your traditional digital marketing, social media marketing, um, campaigns to to simply let them know the GSA exists and what they do. Um, and then I think beyond that, the GSA can leverage its strengths that it already has. Um, I think in particular for niche companies, uh, deep tech companies, uh, could gain immensely from access to government resources from perhaps non-dilutive financing for R&D, for uh, re the reputational boosts that would come from collaborating with luminary or high-profile government agencies. Uh, and these could be some of the incentives as well that tech companies could gain from working with the government. And I think also maybe just a, touching a little bit on the, the, the diverse slider, supplier base, especially in terms of technology companies, I think um, there, we heard some you know, very salient points from, uh, from Tia, from Daryl, uh, and also the topic of intentionality resonated with me uh, because of some of the uh, initiatives that, that we've done within our, our own firm. And uh, we um, engaged with a, a, a DNI um, uh, expert. Uh, uh, she's a member of our advisory board. And we, we grew to understand that inclusiveness requires more than just being open-minded. It's uh, It does require that active intentionality, um, especially in communication. And, and I can't claim that we're, we're experts at, at this, um, only that we became aware that we need to be deliberate in finding uh, entrepreneurs from, from underrepresented um, communities. Um, and then it really... I think comes from also building a larger network step by step. You start with, you know, you know, a, a one or two black entrepreneurs, and you can leverage that relationship to meet more and more. Um, and I think uh, another thing that we have seen is that uh, my my partners are are both from uh, from Latin America, and so we have a lot of entrepreneurs that we work with from from Latin America or. Um, uh, Spanish speaking uh, or Portuguese speaking um, entrepreneurs uh, as a result of that relationship and simply having those members of the team starts creating those opportunities to work with those groups. And um, so I think that's also something that, that we've recognized and um, realize again, that intentionality in terms of how you build your team and how you go about um, engaging with, with those communities in the, in the tech world. So uh, I, I think that uh, you know these both these initiatives um, have a lot of, of merit, and I think that there's a lot of challenges that can go along with implementing them. Uh, I certainly don't have uh, all the answers for that, and probably none of us do. Uh, but I think the one thing's clear is if you have clear goals, then you can create a plan uh, to achieve those. And so I, I maybe you just could go into if there's any questions on that. That's more of my my opening talking points. But I do have a, a lot of thoughts on some of the very specific topics. I know, uh, Kristen, we shared some of the questions that you had in your yep. email about some of those things. And, and I'd be happy to, to weigh in on any questions from the committee. Or uh, if, if you don't have any questions directly right away, then I could uh, hit a couple of the topics that I think are 
are most um, interesting to me for this program to work. And one of them was what you mentioned about uh, kind of what kind of awards or incentives or, or things could benefit both the GSA and, and companies, um, how those might work, um, for example, and, and any other uh, things that I've experienced working with the government, perhaps through these companies um, that I've seen as challenges or barriers uh, that, that might exist for those companies wanting to work with the government. Right. Yeah. And I think we have a couple of specific questions that will really tee that up. So we'll get to those. But at first, I see Nigel has his hand raised here. So. Hi, thanks, Kristen. Uh, so uh, great presentation, John. Uh, thanks for joining us. So one of the problems that we're trying to solve for uh, is something you touched on, which is how, number one, we get the GSA brand and actually the, the messaging around the desire for the federal government to expand its marketplace, right? The desire for the federal government to identify these other uh, entities to recruit and retain new talent into the federal marketplace. And one of the things that even GSA pointed out is like, they know who the big guys are, right? They know how to access those folks who are traditional players in the federal marketplace and are, are in this space. How do we identify these smaller firms and these smaller entities and the more diverse firms? And one of the things we're trying to figure out is it, the uh, ability for a GSA or even any of the other specific agencies to identify that one firm may not be the most efficient way. So are there ways of getting to the belly button organizations, the, the, the university that has consortiums and coalitions and so forth, the, the trade associations, the community group, like where, where should we be looking to find those entities that can then reach individual companies? Yeah, I think if my thoughts there are, one would be simply again, that that campaign of brand awareness, which that's, you're alluding to one part of it. I alluded to an, another part, which is just simply getting the brand out there uh, at the places where those entrepreneurs are. But I think universities is, a good one um, to engage with. We do, um, and you know, certain universities uh, do a better job than others in terms of the the level of the companies that are coming out and, and what you can expect from there. The one I think that's a good place to go early. Uh, it would be building that pipeline um, and an awareness again. But a lot of the university uh, entrepreneurs and and companies coming out of there are quite early, I think, and they would not be quite ready yet to be a supplier, but maybe if you have programs that um, help them grow into becoming a supplier, you could get them into that pipeline early. I think uh, angel networks and, and engaging with the Angel Capital Association, which is a, a, a trade organization for angel investors, could be a, a good place to find those emerging companies that are more ready to sell uh, and have a product. And because they the angel networks, there's there's a lot of angel capital deployed into these startups. They're usually deployed when they're relatively early. Um, and I think that uh, if they, they would be a good place to engage, I think. And, and that, that's something, perhaps that's an area where I could, could assist with uh, having founded a, a large angel network and um, being connected to many. Maybe that's something we could talk about how that might make sense and what, what would make sense to align the incentives with the angel networks uh, to want to do that. And, and then that might go back and then to speak to some of the, the um, barriers that are out there as well. And maybe it's worth getting out there is there is some perception out there in, in the venture capital community, except for some very niche uh, venture capital firms or, or angel groups that uh, they, they don't like to see companies that are over-indexed on government in terms of their business model. Uh, because uh, government is sometimes seen as an unreliable uh, customer, uh, especially if there happens to be, uh, you know, budget cuts or, you know, suddenly the, you know, I, I know it never happens, but maybe, maybe Congress doesn't approve a budget. Um, I was going to say, we don't, we don't reduce budgets in this government. <laughs> yeah. So um, it, it can be seen as a, a a risky business model. And and, and we've seen companies who are either fully only have government uh, customers or, or have a large percentage of their customers uh, be government, um, you know, get sort of taken down by the, you know, the winds of, of political 
things going on. So it, it, it can be a, a challenge there. But at the angel level, uh, if you can get in earlier, there's going to be more openness, uh, I think, to, to government uh, as part of the business model, if, but not the entire business model. Um, so I, I guess just the, the short answer to your question, I think that universities could be good as an early pipeline brand awareness point of view. Angel networks might be a better place to really find those companies that might be ready to, to be a supplier. John, you bring up a good point, though, and you and I had a pretty lengthy discussion about this, um, and we find this in a lot of our discussions. So there's there's perceptions about working with the government, and then there's there's and there, and some of them are just perceptions, and some of them are realities. Um, and so, from a venture capital standpoint, and a, an emerging company. Um, there's a bit of a disparity between uh, kind of like expected metrics from an emerging company and the perception of the government's long sales cycle time and uh, the need for revenue year, month over month. Can you just talk a little bit about that uh, based on your perceptions of that viewpoint? Yeah, I mean, in, in some sense, you know, we say government, but in, if we think of government as just a an enterprise customer, call it. Um, it. It's it's the biggest of the biggest enterprise customers. So, you know, if if a, uh, a tech company is going to struggle to penetrate and get into, say, selling to a GE or you know Google, or they they generally first are discouraged from spending too much of their time going after big enterprise accounts when they are new because they're long sales cycles, very very challenging, uh, very time consuming. Um, to to get in there. Now, the advantage is, is when you, once you do get into one of those big accounts, um, then the expansion opportunities are are huge. And if you can prove yourself, and um, that's usually the benefit of getting into a big organization is that promise of, and I don't mean that the organization promises of it, but, but just the possibility that once I get that one office or business unit with, uh, you know, with a, a big conglomerate or a big Fortune 50 company, then I can expand that more quickly over time uh, and, and grow my business faster. So, but if you spend all of your time focused on those big organizations and only those big organizations, you might run out of capital before you can, can actually land those accounts. And, and we've seen it. Sometimes it can take two years to, to land business at say a, a Walmart or, or something like that. Um, so I, I think that, that that's an important thing to remember. And as far as engaging with then or or making that easier for these early stage companies in technology is if there's some roadmap that if, if you accomplish these things or if you demonstrate that you know the the value of, of your technology if there can be a little bit more quantifiable you know it would never be a guarantee but this will happen, then we would then expand this in this way or giving them some understanding of how that's going to generate future growth and that they're not going to uh, not going to spend a year. Um, and this is another maybe a challenge we can talk about, about how I think government and big enterprises often find about uh, these tech startups is they're not going to spend a lot of time, end up doing a pilot or a proof of concept, which are generally unprofitable. And then at the end of it, somebody says, oh, that was nice. Um, you know, thanks. And yeah, they can't gonna... survive under that cycle, right? Just based right. on where they are. And I think that that's an interesting um, dilemma, which could lead us, I'm going to jump around a little bit, could lead us into, so I've shared with you kind of our recommendation one and how we're going to create a pipeline. We're hoping to create a pipeline of challenges that GSA could consider. So Let's talk a little. We talked a little bit about what type of prizes for these prize competitions would be most beneficial to emerging startup uh, innovative companies that are coming in um, from your perspective. Yeah, that was a, a really good question. And, and I think I put another sort of clause on that, which is also making sure that those prizes benefit the goals of the GSA as well. Um, and, and by that, I mean, making the maybe the the prize be something that not only is a value to the startup but is something that helps it make it easier for them to 
to get into government contracting. Um, I mean, a good example of that, I think, is as you, as you all probably know that a, a lot of the uh, emerging technology companies out there have a, a product that has some component of cloud uh, uh, on it. And the, the barrier of entry into government for uh, cloud-based technology companies is that is, is FedRAMP. Uh, honestly, it's FedRAMP is is extremely time consuming, complicated, and expensive to implement for a company that might have ten or fifteen people and a million dollars in revenue, um, and and it it can consume almost all of their available resources to do that, or they have to hire consultants to help them do it, which can can cost a lot of money. Um, and, and probably even in the best case, they're still going to have to hire some level of consultant. So I would say having some award that helped them offset those costs or that that burden or um, to be able to to supply the the, the government with a SaaS solution, a cloud-based solution um, would be one of those ideas where, you know, instead of giving them, you know, you know, a lot of the competitions in the private sector, you know, the, the startup does something, they do a competition and maybe they'll get, you know, $25,000 or $50,000, um, you know, and, and it's nice. Um, but I think what the government does, doesn't want to give away cash prizes, but if you can give away some services, some, some support uh, that do have monetary value um, and it, it directly aligns with your goal of getting them into the government supplier base, I think those types of incentives would be uh, the most useful. So just following up on that, there, there, there are a couple agencies, um, whether it be SBA and through their, their national partners, whether it's small business development centers, women's business centers, and so forth, and even things like uh, the SCORE uh, Foundation provide technical assistance. Um, it, is that an avenue for if if there were opportunities for us to again get the message out to the marketplace, right? But is there a gap there if they're able to help these companies with the technical assistance necessary to get fed ramped or or address some of these um, these regulatory burdens? Would that be helpful? Because I'm just thinking of the, the, the service is one side and maybe a grant to cover you know some of the costs for a small business. Um, cause there are grant programs as well, right? So, uh, with, within these agencies, uh, minority business development agency and so forth, who so are trying to recruit these firms, um, would it be helpful if there were some type of grant slash technical assistance tied that would be available if these small firms wanted to enter the marketplace? Yeah, I, I think certainly, um, uh, you know, and, and, there would probably have to be a study to understand what all those costs and, and effort are uh, for for these smaller companies. You know, we're talking about FedRAMP, but but there can be others. You know, quite frankly, for some of these companies, even simply getting on a, a multiple award schedule uh, can be challenging. And I think it's simply because the the process once you know it, it's not particularly uh, difficult, but it's it's a little bit hard to figure out what to do the first time you're trying to go through it. So um, I think, you know, grants for something where they might need a lot of assistance uh, to do something um, like with FedRAMP is helpful, but even something simply like a, a, a Sherpa type of, you know, or, or a liaison that can help them through the process of getting, you know, on schedule, for example, um, if, if that's the path they were going. Um, or or helping them walk through the the, the process, and I mean, I, I have some anecdote on that recently from a, a company I worked with, and this is not a particular knock on uh, working with government because this happens in large enterprises also. But um, I was working with a a tech startup who who had a solution for um, a, that was partic particularly relevant to a, one one specific government uh, agency or organization uh, who had some form of liaisons and. Um, and they contacted them. Um, they, it was several, uh, there's different regions throughout the, the country. And, and I don't remember how many there were, but they may, may have contacted 15 or 20 of these regional liaisons. Um, but they only got responses from two. 
um, via email at least, and they only had email addresses, um, which I think they'd gotten from their local, I think it's called Apex Accelerator now is, is what uh, the, the program's called, who had given them the contact information. And the, the two that replied, you know, and said, okay, we'll send us over your, your capability statement, your, your, your marketing collateral, and, and we'll pass it on to the people who might be interested and let you know if they're interested in what you got. And then it kind of goes dark. And again, this happens in big enterprises also, you know, and we've all may have experienced that even in the job application process, right? You know, there's no, nothing worse in your gut when you apply for a job and somebody says, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on to the hiring manager. And if they're interested, they'll call you. And, you know, everybody kind of knows what the result typically of that has been, at least those of us who've been on the job hunt. Um, so I think it's kind of when things kind of go into that black hole, um, and not knowing what's going to happen next is is a challenge for entrepreneurs. So having really that somebody they can contact who can answer them and say, okay, yeah, we know it went dark, but it's not really dark. Here's what's happening. Or, or let me find out for you. Um, uh, because again, government's like the biggest of biggest enterprise customers. And um, it, it's hard to know what's going on. So some level of visibility, I think, is is helpful um, for, for those companies just to know that... It, it didn't just go into the ether somewhere and, and nobody's working on, on it or, or at least just to know that, Hey, we're not interested. That's even that's. that's yeah. Something. Sometimes a definitive no is better than unknown, you know, right. Because I think when we hear that uh, we've heard this from some of the earlier comments too, these, the resources in these companies are so um, limited. Right. Mm -hmm. So to go to spend time and energy to go down a path that doesn't lead to anything is extremely detrimental uh, for, for folks like that. I love the Sherpa comment. I made a note of that um, as part for us to take back and discuss. John, I wanted to ask you about something kind of specific. So part of our current role mandate from the GSA administrator is focusing on uh, sustainability and government procurement and climate risk mitigation. So do you have any thoughts for us as a subcommittee about how we can best um, target or identify um, those companies that are really doing groundbreaking work in these fields that we may not, they're just not on our radar screen. And we, if we wanted to go out and find them, how would we begin to go look for that? Yeah, again, I think it goes back to what I was saying, sort of from a, a GSA go to market point of view is, um, you know, think about this as a as a marketing initiative and where where are they? Where do they get their information? Um, you know, are they what kind of, um, you know, boards are they, you know, looking at and posting things on? Um, you know, whether the, you know, maybe the angel groups and things like that really going out there and and being very specific about these are the kinds of things that we're looking for um, in, in the GSA and um, and seeking them out. So it, it's just like it, you know when when a brand new startup goes out and they nobody knows what they do and nobody knows who they are, so they have to do a, a, a lot of brand awareness and um, and then get that information out there. And then and if it's a possibility, uh, you know, and I don't know how you know. What what the government you know can and will do at, from time to time, but um, you know then maybe do some press releases to highlight it. For example, that um, hey the, the this this company you know the you know the GSA connected this company you know with this initiative our you know lighthouse initiative or whatever it might have been or an innovative entrance initiative, um, and you know this company got a contract you know to do a development with. NASA uh, for this kind of technology, for this sustainable materials technology. Um, uh, you know, for example, you know, I'm referring to something like a Bloom Labs that we, we talked about, Kristen. Um, so it gets out there so people can see that and then making sure that it that information gets to the places where they are. Um, you know, so identifying who is your your target market segment and, and what are their profiles and what would be the best way to get in front of them. And, and get them the information that the GSA exists, that these are the types of things that you are looking for and what they can expect to, to get from that, you know, what, um, you know, based on what they have to offer. 
So what, okay. what can they offer you and what, what can, can the GSA offer them? And I think that's a, a big thing because I, I really do think that right now the brand awareness is a, a big issue. Is I, I think a lot of um, entrepreneurs out there either never thought that a company like them could even ever be a supplier for for the government, um, or they have maybe have some wrong impressions about exactly what it means to supply the government. Okay. Let me ask it a different way. If your investment group was wanting to say, if you had a board meeting and you guys said, hey, you know what, we really need to go out and find companies that are um, dealing with climate, climate risk mitigation and sustainable products, how would you begin that search? Like you wouldn't go to GSA and say, who do you got? What would what would you all do? Who would you talk to? Yeah, well, some of the same things that I was just saying, and and actually, I think maybe part of that is is that because entrepreneurs sort of understand what we do, right? Um, and and people within our ecosystem say whether that's investors or people who are in the the support services community or uh, you know accelerators and and things like that. Uh, I think those. Um, they they come to us quite quite frankly um, we 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 go at, we seek out companies um, but also we get a tremendous amount of companies you know filling our inbox every day um, because they know to look for us because they you know we're we're on you know different platforms or you know we've got the the right keywords and things in our LinkedIn profile or um, you know we're on Signal which you know you know or are on different places where these entrepreneurs, you know, live digitally. And, yeah, correct. Yeah, that's and, kind and, of what and, I'm asking. And trust me, entrepreneurs, when, they, when, 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 they're, when they're young and growing, and I mean the company young, and not necessarily the entrepreneurs, but when, when the companies are young, they're growing, they've got a lot of fire in their belly and, um, you know, want to build their business, um, you'd be amazed at how good they are at finding you if they know you're there. If, if mm -hmm if they know that you do that kind of thing, um, you know, th th they find everybody and they want to talk to everybody and they're on the phone constantly looking for those great partners um, because they really want to grow their business. Um, so as long as they know that that's what you do and it's, it's clear and it matches what they want to accomplish, they'll find you. That's good. Yeah, and I because I think we heard Tia say also somebody uh, during that conversation said you know finding these folks where they are right uh, and I think that's that we heard that day one as a subcommittee uh, when we spoke with GSA is we don't know where to go and where to look or even target some of this marketing um, and you know and so and we you know just blanket resourcing out is is not an effective strategy either so i think as we try and flush this recommendation out for them the more kind of examples we can 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 pinpoint um i think that helps so even like both of these organizations coming on and talking to us today very different some similar some similarities some differences different target markets but it will be a good example to exemplify the power of the network mesh and the lighthouse, right? If you can connect three different organizations, you actually create syn synergies in their own worlds, but then you also create synergy for the government. So that's uh, super exciting, this conversation. Let me see if anyone else has any other questions. Or John, uh, if there's other, I know you and I went back and forth on questions. Are there other key points you want to make? It, the only other thing I was thinking uh, is, you know, there are um, programs out there quite often uh, run by some of the, the technology startup accelerators, um, especially uh, some of the larger ones, where, where we've seen those be not, I would say, where it, it, they don't align as incentives. So maybe this is something where at least empirically, um, we would maybe think that the GSA direction wouldn't want to go and I think Kristen, you you might may have encountered or worked with some of these, uh, you know, some of the accelerators in your your past life um, at, at the post office. And uh, one of the things we've seen is quite often there's the uh, uh, programs with um, some accelerators where it's like uh, innovation scouting or things like that in a, a large enterprise or in sometimes government organizations hire them to say we want to see you know tech startups in this space and. And then they try to do matchmaking. 
Yep. Uh, but what we've seen, at least the challenge we've seen with those programs for uh, for tech startups, is that uh, quite often those initiatives are launched by say innovation teams within a, a large company or within a, maybe a government agency um, who are not necessarily the people who would be using or buying this product. But so their incentive is to go and find technology. Yep. Um, but they're not necessarily incentivized to implement that technology within the organization um, to, to buy it or, or you know, that it, that it gets used or that it grows or that it benefits the government agency or, or the company. They're just incentivized to find that technology. And, the, and the, the accelerators who provide those services are generally paid to introduce, you know, 10 companies a year something right. like that and they'll they'll get a you know a fee for for doing so but they're not necessarily incentivized to to do any more than that and a lot of times that just again puts the the startups into sort of a a, a cycle of where they're not going to end up with with a contract um and they're not talking to the right people really on on either side so i think those types of things should be avoided honestly um and it, there should be more of a a push to really more of a traditional sales engagement vendor buyer relationship where what they end up doing for you and the effort they put into it is really destined to result in in you know selling their product to the government um, to the people who want to buy it and not necessarily again ending up in that endless proof of concept mode or even just a right. one-time proof of concept mode that, that ends up in nothing so I think when it goes to say the the lighthouse, I, I like the idea of going out and finding interested organizations who who want to you know help those startups succeed and are not necessarily um, just doing say introductions for a fee. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yep, great points, John. Thank you. I, I'm taking notes furiously, so that's why I'm not looking up. Awesome. Any, um, let me, I want to be mindful of time um, from the subcommittee. Any other questions uh, specifically for John? Okay. Well, hey, Kristen, I, I do yeah. have one. Um, okay. one. One thought I had, John, is that a traditional way of market research for the government contracting professionals and programs is we use uh, RFI, request for information, quite often. And that's sort of the standard way of going out there and see what's in the market before you start a new program. But I wonder if you have any thoughts on how, you know, I like the, the thought of improving the brand or getting the brand out there, but this is one way to get the brand out there. I wonder what you think would, would be good things to keep in mind when you're doing these RFIs and, and you're trying to find who's out there for a new program. What, what are the kind of things that you think would be helpful to attract? The different businesses you want to work with and then to ask the right questions there to help you see who's out there yeah because that's that's a traditional path that that we normally right. use in the government right yeah and and, and i I've, I've seen that and um and i think that maybe part of it is one maybe part of your question um boris is what what should information should be in that rfi mm -hmm. but I, I think i would also go back to what we talked about <clears throat> at the uh, earlier is um, how would the startup even find that RFI? Because at least my experience right now, right, right, has been exactly. that um, those RFIs don't find the entrepreneurs or the companies. The companies who do government contracting and are experienced with it, they know to go out and look for those, or they're getting them in their inbox because uh, they're, they've been on a mailing list or, or something uh, of that nature. So they they have found out and figured out how to get access to or, or find those RFIs and they, and they do it actively because they're trying to get government business. But, but those RFIs don't find people who don't even know to do business with the government. So I think that's, that's part one. And then I think the other part is that I, I the RFIs, I think for, for me, I, I can, I get them. I, I understand what it's being talked about, but they're a little bit, I would say dense in government jargon quite often for, an entrepreneur that looks at that and to understand what it is. And, and I think, and I, I can't say I've, I've looked at every single RFI. So there could be some out there that are, are very 
very different from what I'm characterizing them as. And I apologize if I'm if I'm mischaracterizing some of those those documents. But I think what entrepreneurs in the tech industry think about is um, problem solution and use cases. So rather than sort of a this description where you sort of got to already know what this agency does or what they're looking for is, and I think this could be also easier for the agency also going back to, I think that sometimes you don't even know that technology, what exists out there and what, what entrepreneurs are doing and what problems they're trying to solve. So if you can express it in the form of a use case where it says, you know, we're trying to do this, or here's the use case. We need this kind of, you know, uh, you know, product that will solve this kind of problem, and it should solve it in then such and such and such a way, without getting into the details of it, leaving it very open ended as to what could solve that problem. But here's the problem. Here's sort of the con big box around what that that solution has to fit into for it to work. And then the entrepreneurs can use their their ingenuity and um, and vision or or their knowledge of their product to say I can solve that problem, and here's how I would solve it. And and you might find you get three different technologies or three different ways from three different companies of of solving that problem, and you can choose the the most appropriate one. Um, but I, I do think that working in say problems problem solution descriptions and use cases. Are the best way to help them understand what exactly it is that that is expected from that RFI. Yeah, very, very helpful. And that, yeah. That's super helpful. I think this is an opportunity here because I feel like this is a very well traveled road in the federal government. I know in GSA there's departments that do nothing but market yeah. research and do this. I think we could leverage these paths. And, and another thing I'm thinking about, you know, if you could get those. RFIs out there in that use case description, something that they can understand. And then you can also give them an idea of the market opportunity of that. And then you get that out there on, again, the, the places where they're living on the internet and, and in uh, whether it's in social media or, or wherever else, the, the different platforms that entrepreneurs are using. Um, if you can say, here's the problem we have, here's what we think we need. And if you can solve that problem, the market opportunity is, you know, $350 million, um, you know, so, something like that. I mean, you know, nobody's going to expect that they're going to get all of that, right? Because you can be talking to different entrepreneurs and, but, but just to know what is the market opportunity of me even responding to that RFI? Uh, how big is that problem for the government? Is that, you know, is that a, a, a $40 problem or is that a $40 billion problem? Um, and that will get their attention. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Back to and you, I think, Kristen. <laughs> yeah, no, like the whole market research, and then also this is very helpful for us framing out our our recommendation on the challenges. So the pipeline, and you know, making sure we're um, uh, specific about what problems we're trying to solve with these challenges, so that people are clear to come. It attracts them to it. It reminds me. It's almost like a translation, John. It reminds me of. 35 years ago, you know, when I was looking for a job and I took, uh, there was an ad for an industrial engineer and excitement and blah, 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 and sent it to this PO box. Nowhere on it, it did it say it was the United States Postal Service or a government job, right? And, and so I applied. And so it's almost like that kind of intermediate step. So, wow, thank you. And hopefully it sounds like um, we've helped you create an opportunity with AEC Unite. So two different kind of companies, um, uh, coming together on our subcommittee. So thank you uh, very much. Uh, we we'll probably I will probably be reaching out with some more questions as we fine tune um, these recommendations. Yeah, maybe just one parting uh, or two parting comments. Uh, okay. uh, one about what you just said last there, Kristen, and going to your marketing initiative, if you choose to do one, is, you know, the, the purpose of any marketing initiative, as just as to your point, is to to get that person to reply. So if, if you have to maybe disguise a little bit at the beginning who you are um, to get them to reply, um, then, then once they do reply, then the next you know, part is when you have that contact or email with them is then to you know, get, get the next step with them and just get them engaged. And so I, I think that's, 
that's a, a really smart um, a way of going about it. I'm not saying you have to hide who you are, but just only, only if you think that's a barrier. But if you think it's a benefit, especially if you are doing something for a specific agency that that has a a big brand name um, that that has that problem, I think that's worth advertising as well, because um, that can also speak to the to the market opportunity. And then just my my final remark is I. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you guys. I appreciate that you um, felt it. I had something that might be worthy, worth of uh, telling you all, um, especially given uh, what, what I've seen from the kinds of uh, uh, people that you're bringing in to talk and, and the weight with which they're addressing their respective areas. Um, so um, I really appreciate that you allowed me to be a part of it. Thank you, John. Uh, we're, we're super pleased to have you. So I think um, what we'll do now is we will um, convene with our focus group forum and then we'll move on to um, subcommittee business. Boris, you think now would be a good time for public comment and then we can gear up into sentiment? Yeah, yeah, I think that would be good. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's open it up. If anyone um, not on the subcommittee or committee would wanna chime in, this would be a good time to do so. Any thoughts or comments or things for, for us to consider here? Hi, Boris. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, one thing that was interesting about the last you know presentation is the convincing of small businesses to to consider the government because it is such a big enterprise, but also how it's linked. And it wasn't my experience when I was a small business in some of those bigger for-profit enterprises. And those are just as daunting as the federal government to small businesses, but, you know, really linking the two together and, and seeing if there are any big organizations out there, especially in the sustainability space, and how do they convince these small diverse businesses to do business with them? You know, we, I know the, the federal government seems like an awfully long reach, but some, so are some of the bigger organizations. And so I think, you know, tipping off of the last presentation, looking for ways and, and successes of those big for-profit enterprises in, in crossing, crossing this Rubicon of getting diverse businesses to consider them, I think is, is something worthy to look at too. Yeah, yeah, good points, uh, Denise. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, anyone else? Well, not, not hearing any, um, I will send it back to you, Kristen. Okay, great. Great, thanks. Um, okay, so what we'd like to do now, uh, IPS subcommittee, I know we have about 15 minutes, um, is we're going to spend a few minutes trying to capture some of the sentiments we heard uh, in these two speaking. So I put the, um, we're going to try and do this. Uh, I put the link to the Jamboard in the chat. And Boris, should you or I, how should we do this? Help me out here. Hey, Dave, would you share the um, your screen, if, if you don't mind, Dave? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. And then if you can get in on the Jamboard. Oh. Yep. And so... I think what we want to just do is, if I can do this. Okay, now I don't know what I'm doing. I think I'm looking at David's screen instead of on the Jamboard. Let me go back. Okay. Am I try this again? No, I think you're good. I was just trying to click on your screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, is, yeah. Is it good now, everyone? Yep, we can see it. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, so what we'd like to be able to do is um, just capture sentiment. So uh, I'm going to put a whole bunch of sticky notes here. So if you want to grab one and just type in um, any key sentiments that you captured. Of course, I have 15 pages of notes, so we may not be able to get through it all today. Um, uh, thoughts that we want to capture so we don't don't kind of lo lose all this goodness that we heard today. So. Let me 
And, and if you're not able to get on the Jamboard, if you're in the subcommittee and cannot get on the Jamboard or I think on the phone, whichever way, let just drop something on the chat or let us know and we can type the uh, sticky for you. Either, way, either Dave or myself will drop that on the, on the stickies for you. So for example, yeah, and these don't have to be like uh, well-scripted, um, just things you heard that, we, we want to take back to us on the subcommittee. And so like one thing I'm typing in now is the importance of intentionality. I thought that was pretty powerful in, from both speakers. Boris, this is Daryl. I'm putting stuff in the chat. Okay, I'll go ahead and put those in. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. I see you got your typing them up. Appreciate it. You are not, I will not type <laughs> that way. We don't duplicate. Double, double you are on it. Great.
a lot of great insights captured. So, um, and I'm, I've still got uh, many pages of notes to go through. So, um, okay, how's everybody else doing? Still capturing? Am I on mute? Is anybody there? Hello? <laughs> no, I can hear you. Christine. Oh, okay. I was getting nervous <laughs> for us. We're here. here. <laughs> yep. And this chamber will be open so you can continue to add more thoughts as you as you think of them. Okay. Yeah, so why don't we, um, if we can just uh, wrap up, if uh, I, I have still way too many, so I'll have to come back into the jam board and add thoughts. If other folks have more thoughts and you uh, would prefer to just put them in bullet format and send them over, um, we can, I can get those into the jam board and then um, we can sort these and kind of talk about them. How and how, uh, how this can help us refine our three recommendations. Um, and really the discussion today really ties to recommendation one, which is around the innovative new entrance barriers um, in create, and then allowing us to create a potential pipeline of uh, challenges for GSA to consider. And then this building out of our vision on the recommendation of the lighthouse. So I thought today's discussion really brought um, some more clarity clarity to that. And I think we'll be able to kind of maybe put together like a visual example of what we're talking about um, to try and have it uh, make better sense to those we're kind of pitching the recommendation to. So, so David, do you think we could uh, back out of sharing the screen and then just maybe we'll do a, a group up here? Great. Um, I don't have the calendar in front of me. So I, Boris, do you know when, if we have an administrative meeting scheduled next? So currently we have one scheduled for November 8th. Um, but there again, we can, and, and, you know, it's not set in stone, so we can definitely find a time. Um, if that doesn't work for folks, we can find another time to, to work through those. But I think we're at this point in the business of I know you, you all are working on drafting the three recommendations. So yeah, those so, meetings can definitely happen at other times. But right now, November 8th uh, from three to four is a, an admin meeting. Yeah, great. I, I'd like to try and keep that if possible. There'll be some email correspondence uh, happening where we need to begin to um, refine these recommendations. And I think we have Farad and... Uh, Nigel are helping with Lighthouse and Stephanie's put together a good outline. Um, I'm taking the lead on the uh, maturity model, our favorite our favorite recommendation, and then um, also working on the challenges, which I believe I'll loop back with Farad. And so we'll get those straw mans out and then would like to get the committee, the subcommittee to help us uh, really refine those and pokey oak them. So on November 8th, we can have just administrative discussion about where we are with each of the recommendations. We'll take that feedback from the eighth, we'll refine them and uh, so that we're ready uh, for the output that we need for the December 7th meeting. Is that correct? Uh, de December 5th. December 5th. Yeah. yeah. And okay. we'll be putting together a uh, federal register notice to go out. Uh, so we're working on that right now, but the, just to, the save the calendar, save the date is uh, December 5th from 1 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. Okay. And that's a Tuesday afternoon. Right. And so what I envision us trying to do versus scheduling um, a lot of admin meetings is, you know, we'll take that Lighthouse recommendation, we'll get it drafted out. And then I know we've, we've solicited people who are interested in that. They can work as a subgroup that we can have a quick meeting on that if we need to. Um, so that we're working these three in parallel over the next four weeks uh, to be ready for December. Mm -hmm. and, and we can connect with any other subject matter experts that we've talked to if we need to, we can bring them back and then, you know, me and Stephanie could help. 
okay. make that happen if you need some okay. we'll reconnect with anyone else great all right uh any anything from the subcommittee um uh, daryl thank you so much for introducing us to tia uh, yes and the whole great. concept it, it really like lit this big <laughs> i had enlightenment about the lighthouse i was like it so awesome and then uh stephanie and boris thank you so much for all your help getting both tia and john prepped and john uh i see you're still on and tia thank you again uh for joining us on the subcommittee today and i will turn it back to boris for official duties yes that, thank you again for everybody thank you thank you oh, thank, thank you for rod i'm sorry that's all right you don't have to worry about that we're all good all right one quick right. thing i'll be speaking on a panel on 8th um and i don't okay. until like 2 30 central time which is 3 30 our time okay. so i probably will miss the next meeting okay we'll probably right. just circle back and have some direct outreach with the smaller group daryl too that's working on lighthouse so you can weigh okay. in on that draft and things like that okay. yeah given everybody's time i'm going to try and have it so that we can be weighing in uh, electronically uh looking yeah. at drafts and refining yeah, and, and thank you, Gail, for bringing the HBCU perspective on that. That kind of lit up some lights in my head, too. I think with that, you know, sometimes we forget that's a really well-traveled path, and let's let's leverage what we already know works. Yeah, that was a really yeah. good good addition to this. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. and thank um, you all for your time. Yeah, so thanks, everybody. So let's go ahead and adjourn the meeting at this time.